Hi, my name is Atif Darush, professor of OBGYN Asiut University, Egypt. Today's topic is on the prevention of preterm birth. We should differentiate between preterm birth and preterm labor. Labor has uh, three stages, stage one, two, and three, while birth is delivery. So if you say preterm birth, I understand that delivery has already uh, occurred. So preterm birth means birth between 20 and 37 weeks. If delivery before 37, this is preterm birth. If birth occurs before 20 weeks, it is abortion. While preterm labor is contractions, first stage of labor, change in the cervix, second stage, first and second stage, effacement and dilatation that may occur before 37 weeks. So preterm labor precedes preterm birth, usually. Of course, preterm birth has a deleterious effect on the mother in the form of increased uh, incidence of postpartum hemorrhage, psychological upset, and increased risk of ill health and negative feeling about their babies in the uh, incubators. And the dangerous effect of the preterm birth would be on the uh, new need uh, and the greatest risk increases when birth occurs before 34 weeks and uh, but between 34 and 37 still the new need is at risk and these risks may be short term or long term. The short term are mainly due to respiratory embarrassment, distress, distress syndrome and some chest infections, uh, and increased uh, incubator uh, admission rate in ICU admission, serious breathing problems, delayed brain development, and long term effects include asthma, congenitive uh, development disorders and motor function problems, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, behavioral and socio-emotional problems, learning problems, and so on. Also, there is an increased risk of neonatal intravascular hemorrhage and increased total pediatric uh, mortality. We have to differentiate between two types of preterm birth. The, that occurs spontaneously without any intervention from doctors. This means that birth occurs before 37 weeks of gestation. While medically indicated preterm birth means that the doctor induced labor with a vaginary or by cesarean section before completed 37 weeks for a medical indication like preeclampsia, like antepartum hemorrhage, like fetal risks, and so on. The causes of spontaneous preterm birth are mainly infection, ascending infection, hypoxia, ischemia of the utero-placental unit, which may occur like in cases of preeclampsia and the antepartum hemorrhage, placental separation, some chronic stress, and fetal and uterine developmental malformations. So infections, utero-placental vasculopathy or insufficiency, multiple pregnancies, increased uterine pathologies like malformations, my myomata, and some fetal malformations like macrosomia, symmetric or asymmetric, some genetic defects. All these factors can lead to premature contractions, premature rupture membranes, and preterm birth. How to prevent preterm birth? Actually, prevention starts before pregnancy. This is the optimal preventive measure. We should counsel our patients before starting pregnancy. Those who had history of previous preterm birth or history of previous operations on the uterus, history of uterine malformations, history of uterine myoma, and so on, we have to take a detailed history from those cases to identify the patients at risk and the patients at low risk. The high risk and low risk patients should be differentiated 
and these risk factors should be identified and better to be eliminated whenever possible. Also, we have to treat any genital tract infections, particularly bacterial vaginosis, which is accused to be one of the causes of preterm uh, birth. Sometimes we uh, take urogenital swabs from the endouterine cavity and from the urinary system from the vagina to search for an organism uh, and to treat it properly before pregnancy. Also the endometrial cavity which is the site for pregnancy should be properly evaluated by high resolution two dimensional ultrasonography or better by 3D ultrasonography transvaginally or by office hysteroscopy. Health education for the patient and for her family, how to improve the general condition, how to improve environmental uh, uh, atmosphere around the pregnant woman and how to avoid the possible causes of preterm birth. And lastly, if we found some intrauterine congenital anomalies that are correctable by hysteroscopy, we have to proceed to hysteroscopic correction. Firstly, you have to identify risk factors for preterm birth. The strongest risk factor for preterm birth is a history of previous uh, preterm birth. But unfortunately, this is found in only 10% of cases. So 90% of cases are without history of preterm birth before. Those cases may be due to health-related risk factors or social risk factors like smoking, like underweight or obese patients, like short inter-pregnancy intervals, like malnutrition, like unstable housing, like age, which is maybe very young, like before 18 or very old, more than 35 years old, single mother without a uh, husband, or anemic patients. Those are health-related and social risk factors. Sometimes the community risk factors like pollution, like uh, pollution in the air, in the water, in the food, and area-level deprivation. Maybe uterine overdistension is a risk factor like multiple pregnancies, like polyhydramnus, like leiomyomata. And in some cases, we cannot find a risk factor for those cases with a history of uh, uh, preterm birth. It should be mentioned that ultrasonography has an important role in such cases. And a recent recommendation by the Royal College that uh, the three-dimensional ultrasonography is very valuable in detection of intrauterine anomalies, which are varieties of the Mullerian duct anomalies, whether unicornate, bicornate uterus, didelphus, or septate uterus, properly, as if you perform it combined hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. Of course, hysteroscopy may be needed before pregnancy, to treat some malaria and duct anomalies, which are, uh, according to evidence-based medicine, uh, is a uterine septum, and sometimes uh, T-shaped uterus, uh, without sufficient uh, scientific evidence for uh, such a procedure. And you can excise myoma, which may be intramural uh, with submucous extension or purely submucous myomata and cut some intrauterine adhesions which may be attributed to the uh, 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 be the cause of preterm birth and some studies used hysteroscopy for assessment of internal os to diagnose or to detect women with uh, cervical incompetence the randomized control trial found that metroplasty for uterine septum by hysteroscopy will decrease miscarriage rate and preterm birth rate, and this is evidence-based. Some recent studies improved the performance of uh, those cases with uh, uh, intratine synechia associated with cervical incompetence by hysteroscopic intervention. All these pre-pregnancy steps 
are considered primary prevention, which means to decrease the overall prevalence of preterm birth, improving the maternal health as the environmental factor, and avoiding risk factors, excessive work, excessive efforts before and during pregnancy. And this is good to prevent uh, preterm birth. But still, we have some risky patients coming to us during pregnancy seeking for prevention of preterm birth. Those are offered secondary prevention, which means that the patient is already pregnant and we have to decrease in risk of preterm birth for those cases to carry pregnancy till term. So primary prevention with pre-pregnancy counseling can be summarized in smoking cessation, underweight improvement, obese uh, patients should uh, be instructed to decrease weight, nutritional status improvement, stressful jobs should be uh, minimized or omitted, and so on. What are the steps of secondary prevention for already a pregnant patient coming to us afraid of preterm birth because of bad history before? The first and simplest method to prevent preterm birth is to learn the patient to make self-measurement of the vaginal pH. And the vaginal pH is a good marker for bacterial vaginosis. Because if you find the pH more than 4.5, this means that the possibility of bacterial vaginosis is present. And in such cases, you can give your patient antibiotics, whether vaginally or systemically, to treat such a case. And we had a study that proved that metronidazole vaginally, whether cream or pessaris, are superior to, uh, uh, to other uh, systemic uh, antibiotics like clindamycin. So you can offer your patients antibiotics based on increased pH as proved by self-measurement. And this is a simple kit with a nitrazine paper that is put on a, an applicator and the patient puts this applicator or inserts this applicator inside the vagina high up to catch uh, cervical vaginal secretions and put it on the uh, map, on the uh, envelope of this uh, kit and she can find the pH easily. And this is a magnified picture of this uh, uh, kit. Of course, this is a part of what's called AMSIS criteria, which are four criteria. And to diagnose bacterial vaginosis properly, you should have at least three of these four criteria of AMSIL. First is pH, as already seen. Second is presence of clue cells, which are bacilli arranged on the surface of the vaginal cells, at least 20% per high power field. Positive amine or whiff test, or homogeneous, non-viscous, milky white discharge adherent to the vaginal wall. So the amine test, the pH test to the fishy odor, uh, and the clue cells are the diagnostic criteria for uh, bacterial vaginosis. Now the question, why not to do this AMSIL criteria for uh, those patients who are at risk? Why to do only pH as a screening test for bacterial vaginosis? It has been recently found by many societies that if you make screening for bacterial vaginosis using AMSIL's criteria in patients who are not an increased risk of preterm birth, it's not recommended. And if you concentrate on patients who are risky for development of preterm birth, there is insufficient evidence to assess the balance of benefit and harms of screening for bacterial vaginosis in those cases. So for low risk cases without history of preterm birth, it's not recommended. For risky patients, you may do it, but till now there is no evidence to uh, support uh, the benefits or harms uh, of using this technique 
for those cases. In my opinion, doing AMSELS criteria testing for patients is not costly, is not uh, exhaustive for many patients, particularly those with recurrent uh, history of recurrent preterm birth. So you can offer this procedure for patients with uh, bad history regarding recurrent preterm birth, but for patients with low risk, you can rely on just uh, estimation of vaginal pH. The second point for prevention of preterm birth for those high risk patients who are already pregnant is to do transvaginal sonography before 24 weeks and to measure the cervical length. It has been found in many trials that the cervical length, when it is shortened less than 25 millimeter before 24 weeks, there is a high possibility that this patient has a short cervix and there is a, a high possibility that this patient is liable to have preterm birth. But if you don't find short cervix by transvaginal sonography, this is a good predictive, negative predictive test and its, uh, 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 its value is reaching up to 92% and this means that pregnant women who are found not to have short cervix can be reassured and unnecessary therapeutic measures like giving progesterone treatment for those cases can be avoided. So it is a good negative test for those cases. So short cervix means less than 25 millimeters before 24 weeks. And this is a risk factor for preterm birth in this pregnancy. But this question is, can we perform transvaginal sonography for all pregnant women as a screening test for preterm birth risk for those cases? The answer is, the prevalence of short cervix in overall population is just 2%. So we are searching for just 2%, putting in mind some inter-observer and intra-observer variations and anatomic variations, patients in convenience, and some patients are uncooperative, some patients will not accept transvaginal sonography in pregnancy. These factors can make routine transvaginal screening for women uh, not recommended because also because high false positive results, high use of treatment among people unlikely to benefit, uh, reduction of cost effectiveness, and exposing mothers and newborns to potential side effects. Another recommendation from the Canadian Society that because of poor positive predictive value and sensitivity and lack of proven effectiveness, routine transvaginal cervical length assessment is not recommended in women at low risk for preterm birth. And this is easy by transvaginal sonography. Now we have a case by, proved by transvaginal sonography to have short cervix less than 25 uh, millimeter uh, after 24 weeks. And if it is less than 20 millimeter without a risk factor, so it is asymptomatic woman without a history of preterm birth. Can we offer her progesterone? This is not settled because as you already heard that it is not allowed to make it as a routine. So why to do it for asymptomatic woman? But if it is done by, uh, by the doctor for any cause, you can offer your patient an off-label use of vaginal uh, progesterone. But if the patient is at risk, it's better to offer her intermuscular 17-alpha uh, hydroxy progesterone caprolate from 16th week to 36th week of gestation. Now, some women are not accepting to have transvaginal sonography in pregnancy for fear of abortion because of their bad history with preterm birth. Can we do transabdominal ultrasonography and rely on the uh, ultrasonographic measurement of the cervical lens transabdominally? 
the recommendations of the uh, Canadian society is not uh, in favor of doing transabdominal ultrasonography for those cases. But if transvaginal sonography is not to be done due to any cause, transperineal ultrasonography can be offered for uh, women who are at increased risk of preterm birth. So we offer our patients pH assessment of the vagina, cervical length measurement by transvaginal sonography, the third preventive, secondary preventive measure is to do circulage operation. And circulage is performed, as you know, for patients with cervical incontinence. And this is proved by transvaginal sonography with short cervix, as I told you. So the performance of circulage in different meta-analysis found, was found to have a definite uh, uh, improvement of prenatal uh, morbidity and mortality rates, uh, uh, which mean decreased mortality rates and morbidity rates for the baby, and it has been recommended by all societies to be to be performed if the transvaginal sonography between 16 and 24 weeks of pregnancy reveals cervical length less than 25 weeks particularly in patients with a history of cervical trauma, history of successful uh, cervical circulage or history of problem in a previous pregnancy. We have what's called rescue cervical circulage, which means emergency cervical circulage. Yes, it can be done whenever the pregnancy is between 16 and 27 weeks or 28 weeks of pregnancy with dilated cervix by ultrasonography and exposed but unruptured fetal membranes. It should not be made for patients with signs of infection, prom, active vaginal bleeding or uterine contractions. Looking at uh, prevention of ascending infection, which is one of the main factors for preterm birth, but there is no sufficient prospective randomized studies to support this opinion. We can use combination of uh, prophylactic vaginal progesterone and cervical circulation for patients with short cervix as proved by uh, ultrasonography less than 25 uh, millimeter between 16 and 24 weeks of pregnancy and those with a history of spontaneous, not medically induced preterm birth or mid trimester uh, abortion between 16 and 34 weeks. This can be offered as a combination treatment. So estimation of pH, cervical length measurement, and sometimes circulars are good secondary preventive measures. What about the main topic of this uh, issue, which is progesterone supplementation? Why to give progesterone for a patient who is at risk of preterm birth? Progesterone maintains uterine quiescence state by uh, performing anti-inflammatory effects on the uterus. So it is a good tocolytic drug, a good uh, drug that inhibits uterine initiation of uterine contractions. Also, it prevents shortening of the cervix from the early gestation. So giving progesterone for a woman who is at risk is advantageous. And actually, it has been written that the most important single advance of the last decade is introduction of progesterone supplementation for prevention of preterm birth. But this strong statement is not supported by the results because it lowers the prevalence or the incidence of preterm birth by just 30%, around one third of cases succeed to continue pregnancy beyond 37 weeks, while two-thirds fail to respond to this strong drug as mentioned. But in, in those third cases, one-third of cases, the odds ratio is 0.65, uh, which means that the association between the exposure 
uh, to this progesterone and the outcome of prevention of preterm birth is high. In short, it's, you have to understand the odds ratio. In such cases, if you look down to this slide on the left side, you will find some cases with red color, which are preterm birth. So if we expose our patients to progesterone prophylaxis as a prophylaxis against or prevention against preterm birth, and some patients who do are not exposed to progesterone, and we have to estimate the risk for occurrence of preterm birth. If the risk is similar to exposure, like in the middle two columns, this means that there is no association by giving progesterone to those patients because occurrence of preterm birth occurred in progesterone exposed or used users and progesterone non-users. But if on the left two columns below, if you find that giving our patients progesterone decreases the prevalence and the ratio of preterm birth while non-using progesterone increases the risk of preterm birth, so this drug is advantageous. So if you find the odds ratio less than one for a drug treatment, this means that this drug is good and odds ratio is less than one. But if the odds ratio in progesterone non-users who are exposed who are receiving, not receiving progesterone and have preterm pairs more than, less than progesterone users, this means that this drug is not good, it is harmful. So if the odds ratio is more than one, this is uh, not good for this drug. If it is less than one, this is advantageous. So the ratio of risk of preterm birth for those who is a risk factor to the risk or without risk factor is odds ratio. And this is called also relative risk. So I already mentioned that the odds ratio is 0.65. This means that the drug administration is advantageous for prevention of preterm birth because it is less than one. And also it has been mentioned that 95% confidence interval is between 0.55 to 0.88, which means that I am confident 90%, 95% that the risk range is between 0.55 and 0.88. So we have to estimate precision of odds ratio by the confidence interval, and this is very important. Also, progesterone can be used to, as a secondary prevention after tocolytic treatment for patients who develop preterm birth and uh, improved on treatment. You can offer uh, progesterone for those patients as secondary prevention till birth. There are some strong recommendations of many studies and randomized controlled trials also recommending progesterone administration for risky patients until the end of 34 or 37 weeks. Which type of progesterone we have to use? It's variable. Which dose, which route we have used, which duration, all these are variables. What we have, the uh, most tested drug is 17 uh, hydroxy, alpha hydroxy progesterone caproate, which is given intramuscularly weekly injections and we can give oral treatment like micronized progesterone, didrogesterone, uh, uh, vag vaginal gel uh, and suppositories. All these are form formulas that can be used to supply our patients with progesterone uh, treatment for prevention of the uh, preterm birth. There is no evidence currently exists to show that one progesterone supplementation is superior to the other. Oral versus vaginal small studies. The vaginal progesterone is a little bit inconvenient to some patients as proved by the compliance uh, with its use is 
uh, suboptimal in 66% of cases. There is no difference of adding oral didrogesterone to, to colitics. There is a recent study of what's called early universal use of oral progesterone based on the uh, uh, assessed reproductive cycles. Usually we offer our patients progesterone supplementation as a routine for all IVF XC cycles from the embryo transfer day till a variable duration of pregnancy. So this study relied on early administration of progesterone after embryo transfer and mentioned that if you give progesterone late uh, after proved short cervix by transvaginal sonography, uh, this means that you are uh, you are uh, uh, treating your patient too late. So this study uh, mentioned what's called early universal use of oral progesterone administration, whatever the types they used oral didrogesterone, before 14 weeks of gestation, three times daily, 10 milligram high dose uh, versus placebo. And actually, this is an ongoing study. We do not know the final results as it is uh, uh, registered for trials. Some authors used uh, bioadhesive technology for vaginal progesterone administration to make it sustained release in the vagina as uh, uh, vaginal uh, mucoinert progesterone uh, administration. And this is uh, reported in one study. Can we give vaginal progesterone as a prophylactic, a prophylactic line of therapy for those high-risk cases? Actually, it is not recommended to give it for high-risk cases. It's recommended for women with no history of spontaneous preterm birth, no history of mid trimester loss, and just transvaginal sonography uh, revealed short cervix less than 25 millimeter, as recommended by NICE recommendations. Of course, progesterone use is not out of is not uh, out of criticism. It's not uh, it's not free of some disadvantages. It is a costly and tedious, inconvenient line of therapy, particularly intramuscular in injections every week. It's costly in some Western countries who approved special forms of the injection form which is expensive reaching thousands of dollars per pregnancy. Also progesterone use is not so effective, its effectiveness is just in one third of cases. It has not been linked to reduction in the preterm birth rate at the population level at large. So the progesterone use is not super. Uh, we have to search for other issues to prevent uh, preterm birth in high risk cases. These are limitations of progesterone supplementation as 36% of women with a history of preterm birth and 30% of women with asymptomatic short cervix still give birth before 37 weeks. So even if you detect risk factors and give progesterone, this is not successful in all cases. And this may be attributed to late starting at 16 weeks, and this can be uh, uh, improved by the universal administration studies which are still ongoing. A recent study, which is called prolonged study, which took eight years, including international uh, cent different centers, including some centers in the United States and outside the United States found that there is no benefit to give the patients 17 uh, uh, hydroxy uh, progesterone caproate compared with placebo. And there is no differences for this drug compared with placebo in preterm birth or neonatal morbidity uh, rates in the two groups. This is a very strong study but single study and rapidly this year the uh, uh, American Soci College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and some other societies 
mentioned that this prolonged trial may be a misleading trial because it included low-risk patients for preterm delivery. So selection bias is found in this study that precluded those at high risk for preterm birth from enrollment in this prolonged trials. And a famous trial, which is my study, 2003, should be compared to this confirmatory trial of prolonged last year. And the, my study included 463, while this study, prolonged study, included 1,000. 708 patients. There are variabilities in the selection of population in, the, in post studies and the preterm birth before 37 weeks and before 35 weeks, before 32 weeks are different in these two studies. The first and the old studies proved effectiveness of uh, progesterone administration while this prolonged trial proved no benefit. If we go back to the history of progesterone administration to prevent preterm birth, we should stop at different stations. The first station, as I already told you, my study, 2003. The second station is 2011, where FDA approved Makina, which is uh, 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 trade name for 17 hydroxy progesterone caprolate administration weekly intramuscularly for prevention of preterm births in high risk pregnancy. The third and important station is 2019, where prolonged trial was uh, demonstrated to the people and informed that the administration of progesterone is of no value and at the same time FDA uh, withhold recommendations and withdraw approval for Makina for preterm birth. Immediately the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine found that they have not to withdraw recommendation of using the 17 hydroxy progesterone caprolate from clinical guidelines to prevent uh, preterm birth in high risk patients with recurrent preterm deliveries and we are they are waiting for more studies and they criticize the prolonged study for uh, selection bias Another strong recommendation from the last society is that you have to continue uh, using the uh, progesterone for prevention of preterm birth in patients with a singleton pregnancy with a prior spontaneous preterm uh, risk uh, until waiting for more studies. So this is a uh, uh, a contradictory uh, recommendation by different societies and FDA regarding progesterone use. But generally speaking, till now, the evidence is strong uh, supporting using progesterone for high-risk patients. The problem that the progesterone is not effective in all cases, in just one-third of cases. It is started usually late after proved short cervix and some studies are trying to use it earlier and waiting for more studies without selection bias. Importantly to know that you can screen for the preterm pairs using fetal fibronectin detection in the cervical vaginal fluid, whether it is present or not, positive or negative, between 22 and 35 weeks. It, go, it gives good predictive negative test if you don't find positive fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal secretion, this means that this patient has less likelihood of preterm births. She, uh, she has not to be afraid. She has not to, uh, uh, to take some drugs like progesterone or whatever. 
and this offers safety for 7 to 10 or to 14 days uh, after doing this test. It's a good promising test and some studies are using it as, as a bedside test also and waiting for more studies uh, as recommended by some uh, cocaine reviews. Recently, low dose aspirin between 6 to 13 weeks can be offered for patients who are at risk of uh, uh, preterm birth and there is a big study which is called International Aspirin Trial uh, included 2,000 uh, 12,000 so non-leprous women with low and middle, middle income uh, country uh, attendance and single term pregnancy. And this study found that uh, administration of aspirin between 6 weeks and 13 weeks of pregnancy decreases preterm birth rate before 37 and before 34 four weeks and decreases prenatal mortality uh, in this group as compared to placebo. This study uh, is a strong study published in Lancet, but uh, some people are criticizing this study uh, to know if the administration of aspirin decreased risk of uh, preterm labor per se or uh, preeclampsia in those cases with these good results. And you, we know that preeclampsia is a, uh, one of the uh, pathophysiologic causes of preterm labor. So it is not known uh, if these cases are improved due to decreased risk of preeclampsia or actually due to decreased risk of spontaneous preterm birth. Of course we are waiting for more results but it is a good uh, promising uh, uh, big uh, sample sized strong study. A new advance in this field is to uh, rely on what's called computational, computational drugs, which means that you, uh, that some companies do not uh, test drugs against diseases in the usual pathway of animal studies, human studies, phase one, two, and three. This takes around 10 years to register a drug and this is a very lengthy and costly step. Some companies uh, will make some uh, facilitation of rapid testing of drugs against diseases by testing the uh, rank based pattern matching strategy to compare the differential gene expression signature for the disease to different gene expressions of some drugs which means that they test the gene expression of uh, signature for preterm birth in our case versus some drugs including progesterone in this study because progesterone is proved to be effective in at least one third of cases. And those trials found, and they started by animal studies, found that some proton bump inhibitors work as anti-inflammatory drugs and affecting improving immune responses can be effective for prevention of preterm labor uh, as compared to progesterone like uh, lansoprazole. Of course, these, these are uh, recent studies, but uh, they are in need of confirmatory studies and recommendations from the different societies. In conclusion, I would like to say that prevention of preterm birth starts before pregnancy by primary prevention, primary prevention of risk factors, improving the uterine situation, treating infection, uh, modifying the lifestyle of those patients, treating anemia and over or underweight of those ladies. If those patients start pregnancy, we have to rely on secondary prevention frequent estimation of vaginal pH, estimation of cervical length after 16 weeks, offering circulage in some cases of cervical incompetence, progesterone supplementation in most of cases till now with good evidence, and we can start new uh, uh, 
uh, modifications of some protocols like prescription of low dose aspirin, uh, estimation of fetal fibronectin in cervical vaginal discharge, uh, and uh, computational drugs. Uh, these are new era for prevention of the uh, preterm birth. Uh, of a great importance is a message to all obstetricians. Don't rush to medically induce preterm birth unless there is a high indication for preterm birth. In fact, we notice some doctors uh, go to preterm birth induced for medical indications without high urge to this preterm birth, like for fear of fetal death in preeclampsia, mild cases of preeclampsia, or for fear of preterm of, of death due to previous history of intrapartum death, despite good biophysical profile and good doubler indices. In such cases, if you are heroic in decision of medically induced preterm birth, you are increasing the instance of preterm birth and its complications for the mother and baby. So if you decide to have a medically indicated preterm birth, it should be uh, uh, very, very precise and very uh, selected. And importantly, it's recommended to have specialized preterm birth clinics in the hostels, particularly tertiary hostels, offering frequent cervical canal length assessment by transvaginal scan, urogenital swabs, fetal fibronectin, and other uh, preventive measures, and make some consistency in practice and protocols to, uh, uh, to offer consensus guidelines and national preterm birth preventive programs for every country for doctors and young doctors uh, uh, practicing the antenatal care to minimize the risk of this uh, uh, deleterious uh, uh, preterm birth uh, event which has a serious burden on the uh, health care of all countries all over the world. If you like this lecture, please press on the like icon. If you need more lectures and videos, please press, uh, press on the subscribe and notification icons. And you can contact me directly for any questions at atif underscore darwish at yahoo.com. And 